Marcus Tullius Cicero in defence of Sextus Roscius of Ameria, 80 BCE, part 5. Translated by Michael Grant, narrated by Max Latham. Imagine, Errucius, that you are defending a case which puts you in a position to muster all the convincing arguments that I have at my disposal today. What an immensely long speech you would make. How you'd hurl yourself about gesticulating in all directions. You'd run out of time. I'm convinced long before you ran out of words. Indeed, the material is so extensive that you might spend whole days on each single topic alone. And I won't deny that I could do the same. I hope I am not conceited. But I am also not modest enough to suppose that you can speak more fluently than I can. However, the city is full of advocates, and I am prepared to admit that I am only one of that common herd, whereas the recent slaughter of accusers, a veritable battle of Cani, has left you fairly high up the ranks of the survivors. We have witnessed the wholesale massacre, not at Lake Trasimene this time, but beside the Servilian Lake here at Rome. Who was not wounded there by Phrygian steel? There's no need to make a list of them all. There was a Curtius and a Marius and a Memmius as well, although he was exempted from active service by his age. And finally, there was that elderly Priam himself, Antistius, whom not only his years but the law had withdrawn from the battle. And then there were hundreds more men who used to act as prosecutors in murder cases and poisonings, whose names nobody mentions because of their insignificance. As far as I'm concerned, I wish they were all still alive. For when there are a lot of people to be watched and a lot of things to be watched over, it does no harm to have as many watchdogs as possible. However, as is so often the case, the ferocity and disorder of war means that a lot of things happen without commanders knowing it. While the leader is in supreme control, is preoccupied with quite different matters, there were other individuals who concentrated on attending to their own private wounds and sores. As they sped from place to place under cover of darkness, as they spread disorder and chaos wherever they went, our country seemed to be enveloped in a night that would never end. I would only wonder that they didn't actually burn up these benches in this very court, so that every trace of due legal process might be utterly eradicated. But they certainly struck down judges and prosecutors alike, but fortunately their behaviour was so outrageous that it would have been beyond their powers to eliminate all the witnesses to everything that they had done, even if they had attempted to do so. For as long as the human race exists, there will assuredly be no lack of people to indict them. So long as our nation survives, there will still be courts to bring retribution down upon their crimes. As I remarked earlier, if Errucius, in some case he was appearing in, had been available able to avail himself of the arguments I have offered you, he would be very glad to go on talking indefinitely, and I could do the same. But, I repeat, it is my intention to pass over them lightly, and to merely touch upon the successive points they raise, so that everyone may understand that I am not bringing accusations because it gives me pleasure, but because I want to do my duty and defend my innocent client. Well then, there were obviously many motives which could have impelled Magnus to commit the crime. We must now consider whether he had any opportunity to commit it. Where was the elder Sextus Roscius killed? At Rome, he says. And where were you at that time, Magnus? At Rome. But what has that got to do with it? Many other people were at Rome as well. Let me reassure you, the fact that I name the place of the murder does not mean that I should go out of my way to search the whole population of the city for the murderer. Nevertheless, I now have one quite simple question to ask. Is it more likely that Sextus Roscius was killed by a man who at that time was constantly at Rome, or by someone for whom many years passed 
had not visited the city of Rome at all. It is also worth noticing the other factors which point to Magnus as the culprit. As Erucius pointed out, this was a period when assassins were numerous, when men were struck down with impunity. Well, who were these numerous assassins? They included, evidently enough, the individuals who were purchasing the confiscated properties and the creatures whom they hired in order to do their killings. If you believe that the former category, the people who coveted other people's goods, were responsible for the removal of Sextus Roscius, then you, Magnus, are once again one of those under suspicion, because you could become rich on the money that belongs to us. But if you prefer to attribute the responsibility to a second category, the murderous characters who are politely known as bandits, I suppose that you should just inquire to who their bosses and protectors are, and I can assure you that you will find one of your partners among their number. Contradict this as best you can, then compare your contradictions with my arguments on the other side, and the total contrast between the merits of your case and mine will become glaringly obvious. All right, you'll say, even supposing I was constantly at Rome, what does that prove? But my reply in my client's name will be this. I on the other hand, was never there at all. I admit, Magnus may say, that I bought confiscated properties, but so did many other people as well. Yet I, as you claim yourself, Sextus Roskies can answer, have spent all my time elsewhere engaging in farming and agriculture. Magnus, just because I've been associating with a gang of assassins, it doesn't necessarily follow that I am an assassin. Sextus Roskies, but as regards to myself, I could not possibly come under the slightest suspicion of all of being an assassin, because I am not even acquainted with one single one of them. You, Magnus, had every possible opportunity to commit the crime. And with your own hand at that, there is every kind of evidence to prove that this is precisely what you did. Nevertheless, about your actual authorship of the deed, I propose to say nothing more. This is partly because it gives me no pleasure whatsoever to accuse you, but my principal reason is a different one. If I wanted to speak about all the men who at that period suffered the same fate as Sextus Roscius, I am afraid it would look as if my speech was aimed not only against my present opponents, but against a number of other people as well. So let us instead take a look, Magnus, at what you were doing after the elder Sextus Roscius' death. The inquiry can be quite brief, like our glances at all the other points. Indeed, my... May the God of good faith himself be my witness. Your activities were so open and palpable that I feel some embarrassment about even mentioning them. Besides, whatever sort of man you are, I don't want my eagerness for the protection of my own client to make it seem like I have been merciless in my treatment of you. However, just when I begin to get anxious about this and start forming the determination to do everything I can short of neglecting my duty to spare you, then suddenly I feel impelled to change my mind after all, because now I remember your extraordinary imprudence. For this was a moment when your associates were busy making themselves scarce and going into hiding, so that I would look as if this trial was genuinely concerned with the crime committed, so that it would look as if this trial was genuinely concerned with the crime committed, not by themselves as a result of their robberies, but by my client instead. And to think that all of this time you of all men chose to appear in court and take your seat with the prosecutors. However, the only thing you accomplished by this was to bring home to everyone that there were no limits to your brazen effrontery. After the murder of Sextus Roscius, let me remind you who was the first man to bring news to Ameria. It was Marlius Glaucia, whom I mentioned before. He is a dependent of yours, Magnus, and an intimate friend as well. The fact that he should have been the person to bring the news, and news, moreover, which might have seemed, upon the face of it, not to concern you in the slightest degree, can only be explained by the conclusion that you were already party to an arrangement about the elder Roscius' death and the possessions, and have formed a partnership with some associate to share the crime and the rewards with alike. Not at all, you say. Mali has brought the news entirely of his own accord. But what on earth? had it got to do with him? Or are we to expect to believe that he had come from Ameria for some quite other purpose, and that it was purely by chance that he was the first to announce what he had heard at Rome? Well, in that case, let us inquire why he had travelled all the way to Ameria. 
That I can't guess, says Magnus, but I will now bring the matter to a head, so that we shan't need to see any more guessing. The person Glaukia sent as the first recipient of his news at Ameria was Capito. But why? The younger Sextus Roscius had a house at this place. He had a wife and children there. He had numerous relations and kinsmen with whom he was on excellent terms. So one can't help asking why on earth this henchman of yours, who brought the information about the crime, chose to communicate it to Capito before anyone else. Roscius the Elder was murdered while he was returning from a dinner party. The news was known at Ameria before dawn. How do we explain this incredibly rapid journey, this unparalleled speed and hurry? No, I'm not asking who actually did the killing. Don't be frightened, Glaukia. Yeah? I'm not proposing to shake your clothes or search you to see if you've the weapon concealed about your person. I don't consider it's my business to do so. Now that I've discovered who planned the murder, I will not bother to identify the actual hand that struck the blow. But there is just one question that I do want to put to you, because the plain facts of the case and your perfectly obvious guilt have placed it fairly and squarely before us. I mean this. One would indeed like to know where Glaukia learnt of the murder and from whom, because he certainly learnt of it very quickly indeed. Besides, even if we accept the assurance that he had just happened by mere chance to hear about it straight away, we are still entitled to ask why he felt he had to embark so hastily upon this whole extensive journey and complete it in the course of a single night. Even if we are prepared to assume that no one had asked him to undertake the trip, what on earth was the imperative urgency which compelled him to set out from Rome at so late an hour and to press onward without sleeping a wink all night? When the plain facts reveal so much, any further hunting for arguments or grasping after conjectures becomes unnecessary. Gentlemen, I should like to think that the scenes I have described to you emerge so vividly that you feel you have taken place before your eyes. Picture to yourselves, please, that unfortunate man coming back from his dinner, wholly unaware of his impending fate, and then comes the ambush, a sudden attack. Look, there's Glaukia. He's got something to do with the murder. And isn't Magnus there too? Yes, there he is setting his automaton in the chariot with his own hands to carry news of the horrible crime and evil victory. Watch how he urges his messenger to go without sleep all night, to labour indefatigably in his interests, to get the news to Capitol at the earliest possible moment. I still wonder why he wanted Capitol to learn it first. I don't know the answer for certain but I can only believe that it must have something to do with a large slice of Roscius' property Capito had acquired, since out of those thirteen farms, three of the very finest have passed into his hands. What's more, this is not the first time, or so I've heard, that Capito has been suspected of the same sort of thing. He is credited with as good a many famous victories of very much the same kind, though this appears to be the first major decoration that has come his way from Rome. Indeed, there is not one single method of committing a murder, or so it's said, with which Capito is unfamiliar. For he himself has employed every one of these methods quite a number of times. Sometimes a dagger has been his chosen weapon, sometimes poison. I can even tell you of a man whom he threw off the bridge into the Tiber, contrary to the tradition of our ancestors, because the victim was less than sixty years old. Capito will be reminded, I can assure you, about all these stories if he comes forward as a witness, or rather when he comes forward, because I am convinced that he intends to. Well, let him appear, and please, notice how carefully he will unroll the document he will be carrying with him. It was written for him by Echrucius, as I can prove, and it is the same document which Capito is said to have flourished in the face of my client, boldly threatening to disclose all of its contents as evidence. You've got a remarkable witness here, gentlemen. He's an authority truly worthy, waiting for a personage so ineffably noble that you might obviously suggest your verdict to his evidence without even the slightest hesitation. The fact that these men have revealed to us such a glaringly gl clear view of the crimes they have committed is an astonishing testimony to the blindness which greed and cupidity and violence have cast over their own eyes. Well, then. Immediately, the murder has been committed one of the conspirators, Magnus, sent a swift message to Ameria, 
to give the news to his associate, or rather, one should say, to his boss. By this action alone, even if the whole world has been determined to conceal Magnus's knowledge of who the murderer was, he himself would have unmistakably exposed his own criminal responsibility before everybody's eyes. As for the other creature, Capito, he actually proposes, as I have said, if the immortal gods will relate such things, to tolerate such things, to give evidence against the younger Sextus Roscius. Well, I should have thought that the question is to issue now is no longer the degree of reliance which can be placed upon his words, but the severity of the punishment to which he will inevitably find himself condemned. Our ancestors established the custom that no one should give evidence in a case in which his own interests were involved, however insignificant the issue may have been, and however distinguished he himself was. Even Scipio Africanus the Younger, whose surname declares that he conquered a third part of the world, would still not be able to give evidence if any interests of his own were at stake. Though, when a man of his calibre is concerned, I would suppose that, once he had spoken up, no one could possibly have disbelieved him. But observe what a transformation there has been nowadays, and how everything has changed for the worse. Here we have a case involving confiscated property, and even a murder, and yet the evidence is to be given by a man who is both a purchaser of such property and the murderer himself. Indeed, he is the buyer and possessor of the very estate's which would issue today, and it was actually he who arranged the murder of the man whose death is being investigated by this court. Well, my good man, Magnus, is there anything the matter? Is there some point you wish to raise? No? Well, then pay attention. I do feel you should make absolutely sure what you're doing yourself is justice. For you have yourself, as well as many as my client, have a great deal at stake. You have committed many crimes and many deeds of violence and many outrages, and you'll have also done one thing that was extremely stupid, and it was unmistakably your own idea, and it was not prompted by Echrucius. For it was very misguided of you to sit where you're sitting today among the prosecutors. If you propose to say nothing at all, then the accuser who doesn't open his mouth is of no use to anybody, and a witness who gets up to speak from the prosecutor's bench is equally as useless. Besides, if you had not chosen that particular place to sit, your greed would be a little more effectively concealed and less glaringly obvious, and so you would have been that much better off. As it is, I can't imagine how anyone on your side could possibly find what you have to say of the slightest value to themselves, since this behaviour on your part makes it look as, look as if you are deliberately working, not for your own client at all, but for ours. Now, Gentlemen, let us observe what took place immediately after the murder. Four days after Sextus Roscius had been killed, the news was taken by Chrysogonus into the camp of Lucius Sulla at Volaterae. Clearly, there is no longer any need to ask who sent the messenger. It must be perfectly clear that it was the man who had dispatched that other messenger to Ameria. Straight away, Chrysogonus arranged for Roscius' property to be sold, although he knew neither Roscius nor the facts. We must find out how it occurred to him to covet the farms of a man whom he didn't know, whom he had never even seen in all his life. When you hear something of this kind, gentlemen, it is usually right to conclude that some fellow townsman or neighbour must have been the informer. They are the people who generally perpetrate these leaks of information, these betrayals, and here we're not just dealing with mere suspicions. I'm not reduced to basing my argument on probabilities. If I were... I could say how probable it is that Magnus and Capito sent the information to Chrysogonus. They were already his friends before this, originally. It's true that they had inherited many long-standing patrons and hosts of their own from their ancestors, but they had ceased to treat these with even the slightest attention or respect, and had instead placed themselves under the protection and patronage of Chrysogonus. These are the points I'd argue, and the arguments would be convincing, too, but in a case like the present one, there is no need for any such conjecture, any so flimsy material at all. Even on the other side, I assure you, can't deny that it was themselves who incited Chrysogonus to get hold of the property. If you see it with your own eyes, the man who has received his share of the loot for the information he has given, then surely, gentlemen, you don't have to ask yourselves who the informer was. It only remains, then, 
to identify the people who were rewarded by Chrysogonus for getting the estates into his hands. They were Magnus and Capito. Was there anyone else? No, there wasn't. Well, obviously the men Chrysogonus shared the plunder with were the men who had acquired it for him in the first place. But let's now turn to Chrysogonus and consider the verdict he himself virtually pr pronounced upon what Magnus and Capito had done. For if they had not served him as useful allies in the fight, one can't see why he was subsequently given such abundant rewards. And why they must have done more than just pass on information. Because if that was the sum total of their achievements, it would clearly have been enough just to offer them his thanks, or at most, if he wanted to do the thing really handsomely, to show his gratitude by giving them some sort of present. But what Capito was given immediately was a set of three extremely valuable farms. One really does ask oneself why, and why are all the other farms in the joint possession of Magnus and Chrysogonus? Surely it's perfectly evident, gentlemen, that Chrysogonus gave Magnus and Capito these spoils of war in gratitude for what they had told him. The ten leading members of the Amerian town council who came as envoys to the camp included Capito himself. His behaviour on this departure, quite apart from anything else at all, will serve as a perfect illustration of the general conduct and character and morals of this individual. If you want to regard him as a good man, you would have to turn a blind eye to the demonstrable fact that there is no duty or right upon earth which has proved solemn or sacred enough to have escaped violation and obliteration at his criminal, treacherous hands. It was he who prevented Sulla from learning what had to be done. It was he who insisted that Chrysogonus must keep the whole matter shrouded in secrecy. It was he who pointed out that if the sale of the property were annulled, Chrysogonus would lose a large sum of money, and he himself would risk the capital penalty. He spurred on Chrysogonus, and at the same time continued to deceive the other members of his own deputation. He repeatedly warned Chrysogonus to be careful, while simultaneously holding out false and treacherous hopes to his fellow envoys. He plotted intrigues against them with Chrysogonus, and passed on to him all their plans and schemes. He came to an agreement with Chrysogonus about his own share of the proceeds, and meanwhile didn't allow the deputation as a whole to secure access to Sulla, continually inventing various fictitious reasons why the meeting had to be postponed. In the end, by a combination of encouragement, advice and reassurance, he prevented them all from seeing Sulla. They trusted Chrysogonus's good faith, or rather his very bad faith, as you will be able to learn from men in person if the prosecutor decides to call them as witnesses, and so back they went to their homes, taking with them nothing but unfounded hopes, and achieving nothing and no positive result whatsoever.